point of uh, order. Does the public know that this is going to be uh, public at the beginning of the meeting? So, Mr. Chairman, because it's not on the agenda, I'd ask for the board to vote to amend the agenda to add a presentation from Mr. Whitaker. I think I think I think what Mr. Sloan is asking is, was it done so media could have time to hear this presentation? They were notified of the meeting. This is not on the agenda. Okay. All right. To answer your question, it has not been. Mr. Chairman, I, this topic, I think, is a valuable one, and I'm certainly interested in hearing about it, but I do agree with Mr. Sloan's comments that the public who are not present probably would have a great interest in this topic, and parents who struggle with their children, with their phones and computers and social media, would have an interest in this topic. It is being live streamed. So they can go back and they so, can go back and watch it, right? Once it's ended. Okay. Chairman Howe? Yes. If you read Dean's email, this is a presentation he asked the board if they would like uh, him to entertain to inform the board about an ongoing national it's not really a lawsuit, but an ongoing collection of school systems uh, wanting to hold the social media giants accountable for um, the impact of social media. And I'm sure the speaker would love to come back and do one at a public open meeting, but I think at this point, the board attorney just wanted to make y'all aware of it and see if we wanted to join in with the group moving forward uh, to put some pressure on social media companies to be responsible for the content and age restrictions for our students. And I'm, I'm sure that the gentleman speaking would love to come back and, and do it in public, but I think today, according to what I read from Dean, was just to inform the board and make sure you wanted to move forward. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm inclined to let this go ahead since it is being live, live streamed. And uh, if, if we need to invite him back another time, we can do that if that's okay. I just didn't want the public fussing at us for not having it on the agenda. Oh, it's, no, that's very logical, and I understand where you're coming from. But we will allow Mr. Whitaker to continue if there's no uh, real objection. So, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, th thank you, uh, Chairman Howell, and thank you to the board for this opportunity. Uh, I spoke with Dean Shatley, uh, council to council, uh, several months ago and sent him some materials very similar to what I've uh, presented to you uh, before we started. Um, this case, the basis for this case has to do with the fact that media, social media platforms as they are designed as a product, as they are designed, are designed to be addictive truly addictive because they maximize user engagement at the great cost in time and attention of the user by using various different methods. Um, <clears throat> and, and they are very unique, uh, and some of them are very central to the very product. For instance, uh, a, simp a very straightforward one is Snapchat. And that's one of the primary defendants. Snapchat, uh, you get to post on Snapchat, and within a matter of seconds, what you've posted has gone away. Uh, that opens up avenues for predators, and that's one of our claims. Uh, that opens up avenues for, I've got to get back on Snapchat and send another message because that message is lost. There are uh, all types of algorithms that are designed that way. The primary defendants are uh, Google or Alphabet for, because of the use of YouTube, 
uh, Facebook, Instagram, because of the way those systems work, uh, ByteDance, uh, and um, others similar to that are the defendants. Now, what, what this case is structurally is each school district can take their own case forward. It's your case. You are not in a class. If you decide to go forward, you're not in a class as such, old traditional class action. You maintain your right to your own case. Now, <clears throat> if down the road, the, the defendants decide they want to offer some type of global settlement, you would be given that opportunity, of course. But you are not in a class where you have to where you get a, a notice that says, if you don't opt in, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna be outside of this class and you're gonna all, be all on your own. That's not what this is. Uh, that's the reason why it's called multi-district litigation, acronym is MDL. It's venued or located in the Northern District of California. And California is the state in which this got started. Uh, there are actually two tracks. This would be within the federal system. There's also a state-based track in California because their school districts have to be in California litigating their case. So these defendants, you know, they're, they're being approached legally on several fronts. Uh, I know you're not asking about this, but I'm going to provide some additional information about structurally how this works. When you join a, a multi-district litigation and you file a case, you're in a group in which you could be selected as a bellwether case, meaning um, both parties, all the defendants and all the plaintiffs that are against each other, want to find out, well, what exactly is this case worth? What, what's the real cost to these school districts? So to find that out, you have to pick a school district, try that case out, have a jury make a decision, and you get a barometer of what the case value might be. So when you, when you step into a litigation like this, you're one of many, and that's, that's advantageous. Uh, mass is, is, is helpful to plaintiffs in cases like this because there's more potential for damages that have to be paid by these global conglomerates that are pretty well healed. We're talking about Facebook here. We're talking about Google. So all of that inures to your benefit because you don't, you don't lose your right to a separate trial if you want to take it forward. Now, to become involved in it involves hiring counsel. And I highly recommend, as you know from the materials I've provided, uh, that the uh, school system get involved in this case and file an action and do so through uh, Levin Pompantonio. They have leadership on uh, the plaintiff's steering committee, and that is of great value because you have someone who is present at any potential discussions regarding a global resolution. I don't know if, you all, if any of you are familiar, this might be a bad subject, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Jewel cases, the Jewel multi-district litigation. In those cases, um, having someone in leadership was very valuable. As it turned out, unlike the opioid cases, only the, defend, only the plaintiffs that filed in the Jewel cases, on, only those uh, school districts got a recovery. If you weren't in, you didn't get a recovery. I can't tell you folks, and I, and I know you know this, I can't tell you how this is gonna turn out. I can't tell you that if you don't get in, there's no chance of a global settlement for you. I can't tell you that if you get in, 
that's, uh, I can tell you that if you get in, you secure your position. Uh, if you don't get in, I can't promise you you would never see a, an offer. Uh, but I, I have reasons uh, to think that these large entities, uh, first of all, I think are going to want to try cases and try cases and try cases. I think it's probably going to take several bellwether verdicts before they ever entertain a global settlement, unlike the opioid cases. Um, that was just a different ball game. And I was involved, and still am, in the opioid cases uh, for 20 plus governmental entities in North Carolina. Uh, it is, a, it is a, an analog, but it's not really a, a good one. <laughs> Uh, because you've got Jewel out there where the defendants only settled with who filed against them. Uh, and, and the Jewel case is, is over. This case could run its course after several bellwether trials and be quickly over, quickly in terms of several years out, uh, unlike the opioid case. It's still going on. Um, so what are your damages? Well, right now, I'm going to guess, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, I'm going to guess that there's not a, um, a formal set of instructions or a curriculum. Uh, there's probably, I would suspect that you've got teachers on their own volunteering the dangers of excessive use of social media. But there's probably not a, a, a curriculum set up for that. You correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so some of the damage would, would include helping uh, create systems within your instruction to warn parents and students of the dangers of excessive use of social media. That's one of the easy ones. Some of the uh, harder ones uh, and, and probably more impactful to the bottom line could be uh, funds for additional counseling because you have a lot of students today ha having poor performance in school, they're absent from school, and we have uh, experts that tie and will tie that back to social media addiction, to the excessive use of social media. Uh, I mentioned earlier some of the uh, problems with the product itself and in these platforms. If you try to get off of Inst Instagram, for instance, you have to go through seven different pages and seven different clicks to do it. And then there's a 30 day waiting period in this sense. You're off during that 30 days, but with one click of one button, you're right back in. And you're right back into this Instagram world. Another part of the product that is, I, I, I personally see this as, uh, in, in some of my experiences, very harmful. Uh, kids are able to change their image. So you end up having children constantly seeing their image through a digital image, but not the real image the mirror in the home. And so those, those kids end up having body dysmorphia uh, on different levels. I mean, it really does vary. But all of that drives kids back into the machine and they remain um, addicted to the machine as opposed to listening to the teacher in school, as opposed to listening to the coach. Uh, they're thinking about Instagram. They're thinking about Snapchat. Um, and we have experts that will bring that to bear based on um, their expertise. So that's the case in a nutshell. In terms of uh, fees, uh, this would be a contingency, no fee unless there's a recovery. So the lawyers handling this are totally at risk uh, all the way around. Uh, but are committed to it, uh, 
in large part because you can just see the social harm that's occurred to kids. And in some cases, it's so bad that kids actually consider suicide. And, and maybe, maybe some of you know about that, and that's not news. But, um, you know, that's, that's very troubling that there's a product out there that, that, that's designed uh, essentially dr to drive minors uh, into such a state of mind. And the parental controls that they say they provide are not robust, they're not very effective. Um, and j just a simple thing, so many of them, they don't have an ending page. You just keep going and scrolling and scrolling and you never get to the end. Some of the platforms, once you use the app, you lose, you lose your, um, on your phone, you lose the clock. You can't even see the clock anymore. You have to get off of it to find the clock. So you can't, while you're using it, if you don't have a watch or, or, or whatever, you're not near a clock, you don't know how much time is passing. Uh, so there are a lot of little different techniques that add up to a huge problem that, that is being suffered in the school systems. So that's what the case is in a nutshell. And uh, I've worked with Levin Pompantonio uh, in the opioid cases. Uh, they're fantastic lawyers. I can uh, tell you more about them if you uh, want to hear more information about them. They're out of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, we're heavily involved in the BP oil spill, uh, opioid cases. And uh, uh, the Judge Rogers in California is very familiar with this law firm. He's uh, had cases with them many times. Okay. Uh, the, the biggest thing to me is is there's no law fees up front. Uh, and that would, we have talked about this, uh, some of you have, uh, from time to time and the real danger. And uh, I would say, if correct me if I'm wrong, the companies that are, we would be going after have very deep pockets and have a way of prolonging any legislation, or not legislation, but uh, lawsuits in the courts for time. Is that correct? Well, two of them are beyond a trillion dollars in cap capitalized value in the markets. So, yes. Um, but they are deep pockets, just, just two of them alone. Okay. Board members, any questions? If you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a personal question. It won't have any bearing on, on my vote. And, and just for this question, if you don't mind, I'm going to call you by your first name. Gary, in your heart, your heart, are you inspired by helping our children or by a big paycheck? You know, that's a wonderful question, and I appreciate you asking it. Uh, there are a lot of things I could be doing right now, a lot of things, a lot of different things. Uh, I don't want to be involved in this case except because of its impact to improve the lives of children. Uh, there are other cases I could be working in, and it, my role in this case would be to provide a communications liaison to this board and to your counsel, Asha Leonard and Dean Shackley. That will be my primary role. Uh, if you ask me to take on a larger role, I would certainly you know, seek to do that. Uh, but I wouldn't bring this, I wouldn't bring this to Iredale County if it weren't for the needs of the children. And the only way that the school board can meet those needs is by having the additional resources. Unfortunately, that always comes down to money. But that reduces the demand on the taxpayers, and you folks are operating under shrinking budgets but increased cost all the time. Um, so, um, yes, it's, it's about the children, and that, that, that's why I'm here. As I told Dean Shatley, I said, Dean, I'm a little passionate about this case, and I sometimes have to be restrained <laughs> because of that. Uh, tone it down a little bit, but um, I have, uh, I don't want to, 
reveal too much of a personal nature. But let me just put it this way. I have a family member who I know could use less time on social media. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, at this point, I know there's too, this is too gray. This is absolutely too gray and too broad. I don't understand. Of course, I could say that a lot. I'm confused and I don't understand what it is that you would be looking for in any type of lawsuit, whether or not it's an individual lawsuit, as you say, or it's a class action lawsuit and we join with 60,000 others, whatever. I don't understand what it is that you would be asking these companies for. Are you trying to shut the company down? Are you trying to modify the company? Are you trying to tell them what they can and cannot do? Uh, and of course, at this point, you say there's no funding. <laughs> there's not a lawsuit in this country that does not uh, include funding somewhere. Somebody is supposed to pay. So is somebody after you're going to prove that this is so bad that you owe me so on and what do you owe me and who gets that and when, like she says, 30 years from now when it's settled. I don't understand the specifics of what we would be saying if we say continue a lawsuit. You, thank you. you. You've got a couple of questions there and I want to deal with sort of the last one first. Whichever. Um, the funding that I was referencing, the cost of mounting these cases at the uh, level of hiring, having to hire experts, experts with regards to the product itself. Uh, it's very expensive hiring experts in the field to go against their own industry. You have experts to try a case would also involve what you were asking at the beginning, which is what are the costs, what are the damages? And to make the link between the product and the harm requires expert testimony of a medical and psychological nature. So all of that is expensive. Um, handling this many cases is expensive. That's the funding that I was referencing. You're, you're not responsible as a client. For, no. Right. Okay. So the, I wasn't speaking in terms of f funds that, that Facebook has. Yeah, I, I understand the difference there. Now, with regards to uh, the claims, the claims are for public nuisance. There is uh, a public nuisance at work here because there's a product in the marketplace that creates a social harm, social media addiction. It's a, it's a known diagnosis, and that's the harm that's been created. Now, the impact on the school system is the increased time that teachers are having to spend trying to engage students in the learning process. The additional time needed for counseling those same students to try to self-limit their use of social media. That's, that's where the damages come in. And in order to uh, beef up in the school system, in the Iredell Statesville school system, the damages would include the additional counseling required to do that, the additional hiring of counselors to do that. And also, as I mentioned earlier, adding something to the curriculum to provide the necessary warnings both to students and parents about the excessive use of this medium. Uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to break the cycle of an addiction, even though uh, I subscribe to the notion that choice matters if you have an addiction, but it's not all controlling. I mean, you, some people cannot use choice alone to break an addiction. I can imagine that for children, it would be a million times worse than it is for an adult. And the school system is a perfect location, obviously too much is asked of the schools, 
but it is where there is a great opportunity to help children get out of the, the addiction. And I would include in those cases where they may not have as much support at home for that. Um, so those would be the cost associated with this claim. And, and you're, <laughs> you're looking to stop the addiction. That, that's, the, that's the top of the list. The rest of things might be valid too. And I, I just see such a gray area uh, in all of that trying to go into how many kids would you bring in to have them testify that this is an addiction or prove that that's the case to get anybody to do anything whenever for any amount of money, for any amount of experts. Uh, I mean, you say nuisance. I hate to simplify it, but the guy that's out on my road a mile from me on a motorcycle at 2 o'clock in the morning with the loudest muffler I've ever heard in my life is a nuisance. But for me to prove that and get anything done to him, <laughs> I'm not even going to start. Now, so I see a gray area that I, I have trouble in my mind. And I'm not an attorney. Don't want to be. But I have a trouble trying to f how you're going to close that gap between where they are and what we think they're doing and getting hurt by it into a court of law and get a uh, verdict. Great question. Uh, there was a motion to dismiss filed by all of the, the defendants against this entire case. It was filed back, filed a long time ago, but it was decided back in November of 2023. And the judge said, I'm not dismissing all of this case. And in fact, uh, I'm not dismissing any of the plaintiff's claims for failure to warn that all of these defendants, every single one of them, owed a duty to every user to warn of the danger of the product. Now, that's not the ultimate decision, but the judge said, as far as I'm concerned at this stage of the pleadings, because the case is already filed by, uh, there's probably 600, uh, it's probably 400 school districts and the rest are individual cases that have already been filed. Uh, I was informed, I, I can't, I can't, verify this, can't certify it. I was informed that there are 20 uh, school systems in North Carolina <clears throat> already involved. So those, those are the damages, failure to warn. Now, I, I can't really use your analogy that well, but, no. uh, you know, in a if, if, if you could suddenly move from where you are to avoid this guy, you might even consider doing it. In other words, not warning about the danger of the product is fundamentally a problem. It's a problem for parents. It's a problem for school teachers, problem for coaches, <laughs> counsel, academic counselors. I mean, we've all sort of taken the view that this stuff is benign. It's not benign. No. And so the, da the damages are, the damages, the damages are, and I'm confident. And Mr. Kelly, I, I approached the, the question like you did at the beginning. I did. Uh, but I am confident that the medical and mental health experts can support the negligence claims for individual claimants. And if they can support those, we can certainly support those for school systems, in my opinion. There will be a separate motion to dismiss uh, coming forward with regards to uh, a public school district. That is out in the future. Uh, I'm confident how that's going to turn out as well. I just see a long process that might be not might not be as productive uh i'm quick to remind myself of uh warnings of uh what was it uh tobacco and we've warned and warned and warned and i still think we're making millions on tobacco so the warnings themselves i'm not sure about 
to prove negligence, I'm not sure about. Anyway. Well, could, could I address the failure to warn? The, 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 failure, the failure to warn, not warning, is a basis for a claim for a public nuisance and then the remedy abatement. Now, with regards to tobacco, the use of tobacco, the use of cigarettes has dropped over 50%. Oh, no doubt. Now, I don't know if it's all because of now that there are better warnings, but surely it had something to do with the reduction. You, you had the, the, the tobacco road states start signing off on laws saying you couldn't smoke indoors. I don't think you would have had that if you hadn't had that case. You just ask. Mr. Well, Kuvenet. You know, my job is persuasion. I believe in this case, as I, as I said to Mr. Sloan, uh, I'm very passionate about it, as I said to Mr. Shatley. I, I believe there's a role here for the school system to play. Mr. Kuvenick, did you have a question? I have one. Um, so I've taken a look, Mr. Whitaker, of your features that you have highlighted here, inadequate age verification measures and so on. What kind of um, best case scenario are you looking at in hopes to get these companies to change? Uh, I would like to hear what you're going to push for the maximum in order to create a safety features built into their systems for children all the way to worst case scenario on at least get the minimum of for them to at least get something in that helps can you give me a guideline of what what you guys are shooting for to get these companies to do well in, in terms of uh, parental controls as an example if if <laughs> consent Facebook's consent is based upon <clears throat> whether a child who registers indicates an age that would qualify them as a minor. And when they do that, if, they, if they're under uh, 13, if, if they do that at age 12 and they tell the truth about their age and they get kicked out, they get a second chance. So then all they have to do is put an older age in. So, I mean, how's that, how's that, how's that work to keep minors off of Facebook? It doesn't. Uh, in, in terms of parental controls, um, you can know that your child is posting, but you don't, like with Snapchat, you don't know what they've posted because what they posted has gone away. You don't know what's posted back. It's gone away. So if a, if a mean child is posting bullying type things, it's gone. If a predator is trying to get to a child, it's gone. Um, so correcting those problems would certainly be high on the list. And I'm, I'm committed to the notion that that would these things can be brought about, but I don't think they're going to be brought about without pressure. I just don't see that happening. Um, and I don't know if you recall this or not, but within about two years after, actually within about 18 months after the multi-district litigation in the opioid cases came forward, in other words, the, the Federal Joint Panel on Multi-District Litigation certified. 18 months later, various state legislatures were changing the time period by, by legislative fiat, the time period by which you could have a prescription for opioids, whereas it had been 90 days, in some cases 60 days, you'd take it home and you'd have a, a counter full of opioids you're never going to use. Uh, it got down to five days. So there is um, real truth to the notion that a case like this 
when, when school districts become involved, sometimes it brings about change faster rather than later because of how many school districts are involved. And I don't think, it, I don't think reasonable people would have a hard time with the type of robust parental controls that would allow parents to actually know what the children are posting, the content of it. I don't, I don't think that that would be uh, difficult for people to embrace as being reasonable. Now, it's complicated somewhat uh, because of Section 230, which has to do with the First Amendment. But when we're talking about minors, that's a different ballgame. So I, I'm not telling you that we can't achieve that in this case. I'm telling you that I think we can. And, I, and those are some examples, just a few. And that's, that's the goal. That's one of the goals. Otherwise, you're probably not going to get a lot done. If, if you don't actually change the behavior at the company level, you may not get a lot done. Um, and I want to use the tobacco case as an example. I mean, the tobacco smoking is greatly reduced in the United States. I mean, it's uh, unfortunate, I guess, for tobacco, for some tobacco farmers, but um, it has been reduced. Any other burning questions? Mr. Whitaker, uh, I'm pretty excited you're here today. Um, last year, we approved a grant for $17 million for mental health services. Can you believe that? So we applied for and got a grant to solve mental health problems with our students. Now, how much of that is due to social media and cell phones? I don't know, but I think that's a question this board should be asking. To me, though, the damages, being awarded damages, well, that would be great. But what about fixing the problem? So I've kind of been a, a student of this topic for some time. And going back to September of last year, the Prime Minister of Ireland is advocating for national smartphone policy. For example, you know, 16-year-olds and older not, you know, being, then being allowed cell phone access. I don't know the current status of that, but there was an article that I have that, that showed that. Last year, last month in the Wall Street Journal, it talked about school districts across the count country are taking steps to limit and ban cell phones in schools while the children are in schools. This past weekend were two articles in the Wall Street Journal. One that was, uh, can we save our children from smartphones? And the other is from, we can't wait for big tech. And the author of this article is talking about students are actually interested in finding relief because they, f they do realize the addictive nature of the cell phones. So I'm excited you're here and I'm excited that this board has an opportunity to be a trailblazer, to be a leader and not to ignore this problem or be a follower. So I support this measure, but I also support additional measures this board could take. Do we have a cell phone social media problem in our schools? Other school districts are prohibiting students from bringing phones to school or require them to be placed in a, a locker. Mr. Kubinick, I'm sorry. Uh, specific questions right. to our I'm just wondering here. what Mr. Whitaker thinks exactly, of those things. You're exactly right. About this doing things that we could be doing. This is addition. something that doesn't need to be discussed at this time. Well, I we wanted his opinion on these things. We're asked specific question about his, what he's doing, and let's move on because we do have quite a big agenda tonight, if you don't mind. Thank you. Chairman Howe? Yes. Uh, I will say that it would probably uh, help the board if they would read the book Glow Kids. Charles Kelly asked about the research. There are tons of psychiatrists and other professionals in the industry that have talked about the impacts of social media for many years. And uh, Kelly Harris recommended this book over two years ago to me, and I found it uh, very readable. It has a lot of research in it, and 
I don't think that uh, from my perspective, I'm not looking for a monetary gain. I would like to see some parts put in place so kids cannot access social media unless they're the appropriate age. And uh, unfortunately, we're seeing a significant increase in our schools and mental health issues. It's coming, you know, you know and again, COVID did acer, uh, exacerbate some of those issues at home. But, uh, and Mr. Kelly has said this in the past, the other board members, the school unfortunately has turned to be the, the end all be all for societal problems. And our teachers really went to school to teach curriculum. And anything we can do to stop uh, societal impact on our kids is a plus for all of us, I believe. Look at TikTok. I could, uh, I could probably get Mr. Ivy to add it up, and I'm sure it would be thousands of dollars that just TikTok has cost school, this school system. And if you added that up nationwide, the, the challenges on TikTok that are being placed out there for kids to tear schools up and do other things that uh, should not occur, um, things like that are costing us. And in the Jewel case, uh, prior board, I did recommend that we look at getting into the case with Jewel. And I can tell you the, the uh, box detectors in our bathrooms and all the security we put in, we are bearing that cost. So I think if a company is going to create an issue, they ought to be part of solving that issue. That's just my opinion. Well, thank you. Point of order. Uh, you just interrupted Mr. Cuban talking about mental health and it does apply to this and you didn't interrupt Mr. Kelly talking about a motorcycle with a pipe that's too loud. I don't think that was appropriate. Well, thank you very much for your comment and, and I, I do think that this gentleman's time is valuable and I think it ought to be specific to what we ask him and the vote that uh, we'll have an opportunity to take and then any other thing can be brought up at another time. Okay. Time never comes. Whatever. Okay. Anyone else? If not, Ashley, uh, do we vote in closed session or now? Now. Okay. I would entertain a motion to get into this lawsuit or not. I make the motion. I make a second the motion that we engage with Mr. Whitaker in joining this Lawsuit is a school district, as he's described. Thank you very much. I have a motion to second. Any more discussion? If not, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? So I have four that are for it and two that are against it. So we will enter this lawsuit. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to thank all the members of the board, and uh, I have heard know that I have heard you loudly and I know that what you're looking for is more than a financial recovery and I appreciate you making that clear uh, and I will make it as clear as I possibly can as we proceed forward uh, I will promise you that thank you very much thank you thank you uh, I will I need a motion to go into closed session Mr. Chairman, I move the board go into closed session for the North Carolina General Assembly Statute 143.318.11 for the following reasons. Uh, Attorney-client privilege, uh, student matters, and what? Personnel. Personnel. Anything else? I think that's it. Do I have a second? Second. I uh, have motion and a second. All in favor of going into closed session, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay.
Holy crap. <clears throat> But you got more Thank 
State, our State for Board of Education come to order. Thank you very much. Will you please join us in a moment of silence? Thank you. Please stand with us and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. There's a, some changes to the agenda, uh, board members. Uh, first, uh, under the um, recognitions, uh, D and E will be uh, eliminated from tonight's agenda. We'll do it another time. And on uh, H, on the third page, uh, the uh, presentation by Dr. Jeff James will be done at another time. So those are two off. Um, do I have any other changes? I'd like to make a motion we add board member comment to the agenda. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sloan has made a motion. Second. I have a second. Is there any discussion on that? Dis okay. Discussion. Um, I'll be short. I usually tell why I want to have board member comment. This time I want to go over, uh, I'm, I'm only an expert really in one thing in life and that, that would be poultry. In 1986, I started as a service worker for Hubbard Farms. 1987, I switched to the hatchery. 1989, I started building chicken houses. 1995, I built two for myself. And as of now, I take care of six. So. Really, that's the only thing I'm an expert in, and I believe that the reason we don't have board member comment is because y'all are chicken. <laughs> Thank you for, for that. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman, you like to say that, you know, we, the board members should be highlighting those things going on in our schools that are great happenings, great successes, and I agree. And we have successes to talk about. And for the last five or six months, you won't let us do that. We can't speak about our interactions with children, visits to schools, discussions with principals and teachers. Why not? It's not acceptable, this blatant censorship and abusive behavior. Where's the reasonableness and the compromise and the fair-mindedness? Okay, since you ask, uh, we don't use that time to threaten uh, a political party or an individual or a media outlet, which that's what they were used for in, in, in one case several times. So that's what I've done. Do I, uh, Doug, are you with us? I am here. Okay. Is there any, do you have any comments? No comments. I'm ready to vote. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. So it's, it fails, four to three. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I have several additions to the agenda. Since you have asked us to follow board policy and asking for agenda items, I have done so, and you have continued to ignore those requests. So that leaves me with no choice but to make several motions for additions to the agenda. The first one is a motion to provide an update on the Weathers Creek High School timelines and milestones. And, and I, have, I have taken care of that, sir. Uh, I've also uh, taken care of the other question that you had about the uh, progress of um, the work at West Ardell High School. You'll be getting a report on that. I didn't ask for an update on the West Ardell High School. I asked for an update on the West 
on the new high school, the, the Weathersfield. Okay, I'll go back and check that uh, email. All right, is, what else, sir? I'd like to make a motion to move public comment period after the school spotlight and before the non-consent agenda. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that? Mr. Chairman, the public has a right to express their opinions on education-related topics before we vote on them. Actually, you're exactly right, but then they had another time when we first started discussing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the agenda is mine, sir. I'll entertain your motion, but the agenda is mine. I'll continue speaking if the, I may, since I... The order made, of the agenda is mine, I, sir. Parliamentary inquiry, please. Okay. When a, when a motion is made, is not the person making the motion entitled to speak to that motion? You, I thought you were through, sir. I'm sorry. Continue on. Feedback that I get from the people in this room and elsewhere feel disenfranchised because they don't get to speak before we vote on the matters that come before us. The list is removed right promptly at 6 p.m. when this meeting starts. So if you are late by five or 10 minutes, you are denied the right to speak because you've already removed the, the you've already removed the list. County commissioners don't do this. They encourage public participation to speak. Even when someone has finished speaking and the list is completed, our county commissioners, they ask the public if anyone else would like to speak. That's a welcoming environment and this board doesn't seem to promote that. Therefore, I made this motion to add public comment before the non-consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I have a motion to move public comment. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. No. It, pa it fails, four to three. Thank you. Any others? Mr. Chairman, my next motion is to add a brief discussion on policy 2410, policy development. This was a revision to a procedure. Excuse me for interrupting you. Is that one that we'll be going over tonight? No, sir. It is not. Then 2010 is for a vote tonight, sir. Is that the one you mentioned? No, sir. 2410, policy development. We voted on that last month in a slurry of votes on, on all the numerous procedures, and there wasn't sufficient opportunity to discuss a few elements of was it. Was it passed? Yes, it did pass. Well, it's, if it passed, then the, the uh, I'm procedure... I'm making a motion to discuss a few paragraphs from that The policy. procedure would be for you to write in a different one, bring it before the board for discussion at that time, and we could put it in and, and go My through. My intention the, is not to change the policy, Mr. Chairman, and I've made a motion. I don't accept that motion. Because we have voted on that. The chairman it cannot sat. refuse to accept a motion. Or I not. did. You cannot it do sat, that. Mr. Mr. Cooper, it, it sat inquiry. 30 Can days. Can the chairman refuse to accept a motion? Mr. Chairman, I would entertain the motion and just do a vote. Okay. All right, we're going to vote on that. Do I have a second? Second. All right. What, what, are, what is your motion again? The motion is policy 2410, which is the policy discussing policy development. The paragraph B states, during discussion of policy approval, the views of the public, parents, students, and staff will be considered. How will this occur when policy changes and revisions are kept from public view? This board refuses to make the public the documents that we review each month available for public view. Why? Other school board districts publish their meeting documents as well for public viewing prior to board meetings. Our board does not. County commissioners publish meeting documents provided uh, prior to their meetings so the public can view the materials and the decisions and the votes that the board members make. It's a very simple thing to do, requires very little effort for our administrator to do. Therefore, I have questions for why this board refuses to publish our meeting documents 
so that the public may view them prior to our meetings so that they are informed on what we're discussing and what we are about to vote on. Okay. Um, I have a question. So Does everybody understand the motion? No, no, I don't. I have a question. So, um, Mr. Kubinick, what what would you like to do? Are you, do you want to change a policy? No, ma'am. Okay. What I'm advocating for is other school districts, for example, Cleveland County, Cabarrus County, Catawba County, New Hanover. If you go to their Board of Election website and you go under their meetings, you will see their scheduled meeting. It will list the agenda, all the agenda topics. And where there is a document such as bids for a new roof or for a new gym or for a poly rev revision, you will see those red line documents and you can see them and view them for yourselves. The public is entitled to this information as it is public information. Everything that we, the board, have in front of us right now is public information with the exception of closed session materials. The public is not entitled currently to view what we are looking at each and every month, and that is not right. Oh. And I believe the public is entitled to view. Oh, are we going to vote on this or are we uh, going to carry well, on the discussion, Ms. Because I'm still not un understanding what he wants to do. He is wants to have a to public discussion so he can show off to all the public. That's out of order. Action. And, and make himself look important. Mr. Chairman, what, I, what I'm wishing oh, us I, to do is for this board to direct the superintendent to publish on our website for each and every meeting the documents for which we are reviewing for public view and discernment. I don't believe that was the initial. Mr. Kubinick, you made a motion to amend the agenda. What's the motion? The motion is to discuss policy de policy 2410 policy development. Okay, Thank you. so just to, to clarify, do you want to change policy so that the all the pieces of the agenda are added into um, into each agenda, all the basically uh, supporting documents? Is that what you're asking no, for? No, ma'am. I don't believe we need to change the policy. The board just needs to direct the superintendent to publish meeting materials. Okay. So the motion is to include a discussion on policy 2410 and add that to the agenda. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> okay, we have a second. So uh, just, uh, I just want to answer the question so I can better vote on this as to why we wouldn't put the supporting documents on our agenda. Do, does anybody have a reason of why they wouldn't want them on there? Absolutely not, but that we're, we're putting two things together, I think. here He wants to discuss a policy that we've already put in, you know, voted on and passed and bring that back up. But then he wants to, for the superintendent, and I thought, excuse me if I'm wrong, but I thought that uh, you, uh, Kelly published that information uh, and it was available. Now, maybe I'm wrong. It was at one time and then I was directed not to Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, just to be clear. Oh, can I have a, oh, if you don't mind. I just, Kelly, I, I was just curious if there was a reason as to why it was asked. Okay. And um, so, Mr. Chairman, do you have a reason of why these documents wouldn't be? I wasn't aware okay. that that happened. And uh, if that did happen, then uh, let's go back and make sure the public can see those. That's not a problem. I, I agree with that. I'm just not going to discuss a board policy that's already been voted on and set for 30 days. I I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I understand that. But if the public had some supporting documents, I think it would be good for the public. Absolutely. To see those. I don't have a problem with that, but that's not the motion. So, um, Chairman Howe, could we just, there was a motion made in the second. Could we could we vote on that? I, I'm not I'd sure like why to. we're going well, off on a. You have to go through proper discussion. We're going off on a, well, on a different discussion. We're not really discussion discussing here. the motion. Well, so, Ms. Ms. Leonard, how, can you advise us on how we could adjust our motion so that we can 
have those documents put back on our agenda? I think you'd have to make a separate motion regarding documents being published to the public. The motion on the table is whether to add a discussion on policy 2410 to the agenda. Okay, so I make a motion that we amend it. Well, I'd like to amend that emotion if, if possible can and see if we can't just get the policy what if I just tell the superintendent to do it and it gets done how about that you don't even need a motion well that would that would be because great. I assumed I, I know it used to be and I did I, I learned tonight that it's not so I'm okay. just going to instruct the superintendent to make sure it's available to the public and I thank good. Mr. Kubernick for bringing that fact up. Mr. Chairman, if you, ins if you direct the superintendent to pu publish all meeting documents uh, on the website, I'll withdraw my motion. I will do so. Last motion I'd like to bring forward is a discussion on policy 2610 board attorney. Uh, what was, what would you, what, what is your motion? To have discussion. Have a discussion on that. Discussion on the policy, why we're not in compliance with it. Well, uh, I'm not going to sit here and have a discussion about that at this time. It is a board policy. If we are in violation, uh, would you give me that number, sir? 2610. 2610. In, in July of this past year, I advised you we were not in compliance with that policy and, and I was dismissed. Well, you weren't dismissed, but uh, uh, I, I informed you that I had contacted the attorneys and we were in compliance with it. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, I didn't go to law school. I don't know. Maybe you did. But, in uh, simple terms, we are not following policy 2610, nor have we followed it for the last four years by this board and the superintendent. So that is why I'm bringing it up for discussion, why we're not following that policy. Well, I will put it on the agenda next month. I agree, and I withdraw the motion. Okay. Is there any other changes to the motion, to the, to the, uh, to this uh, agenda? Thank you. If not, all those in favor of the agenda, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, so I got four, five, two. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, we have uh, our personnel, Mr. Mazel. Are you here? Uh, you were uh, given a some information in uh, closed session, unless there's any specific questions about that that we can say in open session, I will call for a motion to approve. Um, I would just like to thank Dr. Mazzell for the hard work he's been doing um, compared to some of the other school districts that we've had. We have a lower turnover rate than some of the other districts. And I just want to thank you for in a, just let you know how much we appreciate all the hard work you've done to keep our staff strong. Thank you for that. And thank you to our principals and all of our staff too, for that everybody's working hard to kind of keep our, to keep our keep teachers in our classrooms and get new teachers in there. And, and for the public to know, Dr. Mazel gives us a report every month on the status of vacancies and openings in the school district. And it's at the lowest number in the last nine months or so. So him and his team have hired and continue to hire to fill our schools with the teachers and staff we need. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the non-consent agenda? We ain't approved it. We ain't made a motion yet. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, second? Second. Okay, motion second. Any more discussion? All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Passes 7 0. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, number three, approval of the minutes. Uh, you've had time to read these. Uh, does any questions, additions, or deletions? 
I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 4th and March 11th. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? All those in favor, aye, please. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. This passes 7-0. All right, tonight, Miss Kelly Henson, you have some recognition. Good evening, Chairman Howe, members of the board. If I could have a couple members come forward and help me with the math expo recognition. The certificates are actually the first stack on the table there. Idle State School Schools hosted our district, they're up there on the table, the first stack. Idle State School Schools hosted our district math expo competition on March 26, 2024 at the Unity Center. We had 96 total projects compete across five grade level categories, K through second grade, third through fourth grade, fifth through sixth grade, seventh through eighth grade, and ninth through twelfth grade. These students all competed at the school level to move forward to district competition. Tonight, we'd like to recognize our top three winners in each category. For kindergarten through second grade, our bronze goes to Sarija Suresh, Sparkly Sprinkle Donuts, Cottle Creek Elementary. Our, our silver goes to our silver goes to Corbin Kaiser, The Evolution of Mario, Cool Spring Elementary. And our gold goes to Maddox Warren, SimCraft City Design, Cool Spring Elementary. For third through fourth grade, bronze goes to Mason Hawkins, The Birthday Paradox, Lakeshore Elementary. <laughs> Silver goes to Lakshmanan and Amale, Pascal's Powerful Sequences, Cottle Creek Elementary. <laughs> and gold, Advaitha Nathan, Beating the Odds, ISS Virtual Academy. Fifth through eighth grade category, our bronze goes to Varshitha Swathika and Ahana Das, Call Savings of Homemade Food, Lake Norman Elementary. <laughs> our silver goes to Harini Jakamar and Hamvi Majeti, BMI Equations of Health, the Brawley School. Gold goes to Aaron Mansukani, predicting the stock market, the Brawley School. Grade seven through eight, bronze goes to Ananya Bangavali, Pascal's Triangle, the Brawley School. <laughs> Silver goes to Puha Suresh, Age and Health Evolve Around Numbers, the Brawley School. And gold, Sarah Mobin, Origami, Efficient Folds for the Outside World, the Brawley School. <laughs> Our
Our final category for the Math Expo was grades 9th through 12th. Bronze goes to Avea Selva Kumar Origami in Mathematics, South Idle High School. Silver goes to Sana Suri, Kartha Kean, unveiling the future of AI, South Idle High School. And gold, Narayani Garg, application of rational function models and differential equations to determine the most influential compound on histamine levels, South Idle High School. The Chess Awards. Yes. The District Chess Tournament was held March 28, 2024. The Fast Chess Round Robin Style Tournament was open to students in grades 3 through 12. This is the fourth year Idle State School Schools has provided virtual chess using chesskids.com. Overall, we had 540 third through 12th grade students participate in Chess Kids throughout the school year. On the actual tournament day, 36 secondary and 65 elementary students completed 12 rounds of chess play. The online system assigns points based on wins, losses, or draws. The fast play chess tournament was set to 10-minute matches, giving each player a total of five minutes on their chess clocks to make their moves. I would like to recognize the following students who placed first, second, and third in each division at the Idle State School School's 2024 District Chess Tournament. We'll begin with our secondary winners for third place, Artem Adelin, CCTL Early College. Second place, Adam Crook, Oakwood IB. Our first place was Peter Leotino, Lake Norman High School. In our elementary category, third place, Xander Warren, Cool Spring Elementary School. Second place, Chase Galpin, Shep Shepherd Elementary School. First place, Brooks Tuttero, East Idle Elementary School. Finally, we have Governor's School this evening. North Carolina Governor's School is the oldest statewide summer residential program for academically and or intellectually gifted high school students in the nation. The program, which is open to rising seniors only, with exceptions made for rising juniors in selected areas of the performing arts and visual arts, is located on two campuses, Governor's School West at Greensboro College, begun in 1963, and Governor's School East at Meredith College in Raleigh, begun in 1978. Application criteria includes grade point average, essay scores, recommendations, evidence of extracurricular activities, leadership roles, community service, and in the areas of the arts, audition scores. Less than 1% of all North Carolina high school students advance to statewide consideration. 19 of the 45 students from Idle State School Schools who advanced to the state level of selection were invited to attend the 2024 session of North Carolina Governor's School. At this time, I would like to recognize these students. 
Peyton Seldomridge, Natural Science. <laughs> Devin Rinberg, Choral Music Tenor One. <laughs> Liberty Prince, Instrumental Music Clarinet. <laughs> Anushka. Mama Rapu, Natural Science. Yes. Mahil Manaharan, Mathematics. <laughs> Rylan Barker, Mathematics. <laughs> Josiah Smith, Natural Science. Christopher Corona Plancart, Social Science. Hunter Tan, Choral Music, Bass 2. Ryder Reynolds, Spanish. Jaira Pirant, Natural Science. Mary Miller, Natural Science. Hassini Majadi, Mathematics. Mary, Mary Bell Avi, Choral Music Soprano One. Hannah Honig, Dance. Narayani Garg, Mathematics. Indu Gadariyu, Mathematics. Nachime Anamale, Mathematics. Jacqueline Maglente, Natural Science. I want to add that I've been in this role, I'm thinking eight years, and I tried to look back past that. 19 is the highest number I can find for Idle State School schools being selected to move forward. So this is a very strong group of individuals. Congratulations. <laughs> Everybody get your picture? Congratulations to these students. Well done. We, we makes us proud. And if I could ask my chess, club, um, chess recipients to meet me in the back, I forgot to give you your little trophies. Thank you. Mr. Pasley. Rasslin. I guess. There is a girl, uh, one, isn't that lady from North Iredale? No? Lake Norman? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll let those folks leave.
Chairman Howe, members of the board, uh, it's my pleasure to come up to you this evening uh, to represent and celebrate two of our outstanding student athletes from our winter sports season. Uh, both of these young student athletes ended the winter season with the highest accomplishments of, of any and all that we could with being state champions. Uh, so both of these come from Lake Norman High School. Uh, if Kaylee Sudreth and Eli Murray would come forward. Uh, and it is my understanding, Eli, this is your second state championship and Kaylee's third state championship. So congratulations on an awesome career. We appreciate all that you've done. Congratulations. Uh, wrestling is one, one of those sports that uh, you work your tail off and nobody knows it. Uh, you get on the mat and it's one-on-one -on -one and there's no excuses. It's not like a team sport. And it's, it's you out there against an opponent. And, you know, everybody knows if you make a mistake. So I, I really encourage that. It's sort of like swimming. You know, you can't blame anybody else but yourself if you don't win. And congratulations to you students. I know the effort you put into it. Okay. I think that's all of our recognitions, if I'm right. We'll move on. No school spotlight tonight. So we'll move on to Mr. Ivy. Chairman Howe, members of the board, Dr. James. Let's see, the first agenda item I have is the approval of the bids for the Harmony Gym renovation project. Um, this project we've been talking about for quite some time. On September 11th of 2023, the, um, we were approved by the Board of Commissioners to use some grant funds. The board also approved this project, along with some uh, lottery money and some of our current capital expense funds. So. We did go through the bid process and advertised, and we received um, several bids for this, and the lowest bid came in at um, $803,020. So that's uh, the lowest bid for Neil Construction. That has been vetted, and we are asking tonight for approval to move forward with this project so they can start construction. Any board member have questions for Mr. Ivy? about this have we used this company before um, we have not used this company before but the company has been vetted by the architect which means we have to contact other people who have used them and we have to go through and make sure that they have all the bonding and insurance that they're required to have mr ivy has this project been on the books uh, for a long time this project's been on the books for approximately two years when I started in this position, we started noticing that we were having some moisture in the gym. The floor was buckling. When we went to start to investigate, we ended up having to get an engineer to look at it and found out that we essentially had lost the trusses underneath due to years of having some moisture issues there. All that's been corrected, but now we're in the final stages of being able to um, tear all that out, redo the floor, put in new bleachers for the um, gymnasium and then also update the bathrooms there so they are ADA compliant. When do you expect the project to start and complete? Uh, they're, if approved tonight, they will start essentially in May and then we're expecting it to be somewhere around a six month turnaround time. Thank you and, and I'm sure the Harmony family will be um, greatly appreciated. Yes, that's a wonderful gym and I'd hate to have to lose the gym architecture just because of you know, something that can be repaired. Any other questions? If there aren't any, could I get a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve. A second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye, please. Aye. aye. Opposed? Passes 7 0.
Okay, you also have the approval to apply for an annex of additional property of Overcash Road in Troutman City Limits. Yes, as part of the Weathers Creek High School project, um, we ended up purchasing 8.373 acres from um, the Brawley Farm in order to be able to um, change some of the site work there. It was helping us with the creek crossing where we would have to cross the sewer. And so we purchased this land. Um, the land was never annexed into the town of Troutman. And now that the project is gone out for bid, um, the county is asking us to have all of it under the same zoning. And so they want this 8.373 acres annexed into the town of Troutman. Um, most likely for the purpose of once the project does come back finalized with bids, then they will end up wanting to be able to take a lien on that property and they need it all to be under the same jurisdiction. Um, so I am asking you for permission to go forward with the application and then we will work with our legal counsel to make sure that application is turned in completely correct and get that sent over to the town of Troutman for consideration. Okay, this, I, mean, I understand that this land was already purchased. We own it. We own this land. It's just 8.373 acres that we bought additionally Correct. to go along with the Weathers Creek property that we already had. Okay, board, any questions? The, it's going to help get the sewer pipe across the creek and it's Troutman sewer pipe as it is? Well, the sewer will be ours. It's always been a private sewer for us that will run across, but we'll connect. To, to Troutman? Yeah, to Mooresville, yes. Any other questions? I thought we were going to go with uh, Troutman's sewer. So when it's a private sewer, that it goes into Troutman sewer, but Troutman... Um, goes through all that goes through the Mooresville, so you're actually tying into the Mooresville okay. sewer system. Any other questions? Make a motion that we apply for this annexation. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye, please. Aye. aye. Opposed? Passes. I don't know whether Doug's still with us or not. He's asleep. I hope he found his package. Okay, uh, could you give us a quick rundown of where we are with the Withers Creek project, or the high school, please? Yes, so the project was advertised um, beginning on March 7th. It was publicized in three different newspapers. I don't have those exactly in front of me, but it was also publicized on the national um, uh, site where all these big projects are publicized, so it went out. On March 18th, the bid documents were made available for any interested um, construction companies to come by and pick those up. We did have several who came by and actually uh, picked up those documents. The bids for this project will be due back on Tuesday, April 30th, and then they will have to be vetted by the architect. So their recommendation should be due to Idaho State School Schools by May 7th. And then we plan to present to the board, hopefully by May 13th, as long as we have three competitive bids. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I have one question. Okay. If, if you do get three competitive bids and if the board does accept those bids, then what's the expectation for construction start, completion, and school occupation? I think if the board, you mean our board or? School board. If the school board accepts your bids and approves okay. them, and then we commence, when would we expect construction to commence, complete, and then um, full, fully uh, start the occupation of the school? We still have to go through county commissioners, right? That's yes. correct. So once our board approves it, then we take that bid or those, that vetted bid over to the county commissioners. If that is approved at that point in time, you're looking at 30 months from the time that they start construction. So we would, you know, three years from the day that they start is essentially when you would open the school. Once they finish the construction, you want the building to stay unoccupied for a certain period of time so you can condition the environment, make sure that everything is working properly, get all the furniture and everything inside, and then uh, open it at that time. So we're hoping to be have it be finished in, you know, a December, January, or February timeframe so that we can then open it up in August for the kids. 
I hope it'd be three years from when they start. So as we're going right now, we're looking that we would be opening 28, 27, 28. I will say that as far as uh, the commissioners go, I've, ha I've heard some positive things uh, over the last couple of weeks from different commissioners. So I, I, look, f I look forward for that project to go forward uh, uh, at, at haste. And then I also would like to tell the board that I was at a meeting several weeks ago in Raleigh, and we were told at that time that the first billion-dollar high school is on the horizon. So, uh, you know, pay me now or pay me later, but you're going to have a school uh, with 27,000 housing starts being approved. So there it is. Just to make a, a note, the project for Harmony, um, if that project for that gym initially was anticipated to be just over a million dollars. And so it came back at $800,000, which we are starting to see a decline in construction costs. So. Hopefully that will be in our favor, um, seeing as we couldn't in control the inflation rate or any of the other um, different hurdles that we've had to jump with this project. But hopefully this will be a good thing for us when it does come back for bids that we'll be able to be able to see the that payoff. Any other questions? Thank you very much, sir. Miss Jackie Parker. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, Miss Elliott. You thought I'd forgot you. <laughs> Chairman Howell, members of the board, and Dr. James. Um, so each year, the Department of Public Instruction requires me to bring forth um, our options for the alter alternative schools modified accountability options. And so that what that really means is this gives Northview Academy and um, the the discovery program here at DPATS, um, an option of a modified accountability model. So you can see on my memo, um, they are measured on student persistence, which means how many of those students that are enrolled, they stay, okay? They don't drop out, they don't move, so they're measured on that, and that's 20%. And then 20% is on school achievement. So that's where the EOGs and the EOCs and all the other accountability assessments that they take are included. So these students still have to take everything that um, all the traditional schools take. And then they are, um, they get 60% of the growth. So that's what makes up their model under option B. So we have used option B since the state changed the way they looked at our alternative schools. Um, we started that back in 2017-18. On the second page, so they're measured on progressing, maintaining, or declining. Um, on the second page, you can see what our two schools have been. Um, Northview, since they started in 2017-18, they have been maintaining. We've never gone to declining. Um, you can see there are two years there, 2019-20 and 2021, where we didn't have any scores, and that's just when we didn't, back in those COVID years, we didn't have testing. Um, and then you can see the last two years for um, DPATS, uh, their first year they were maintaining, and then last year they went to progressing. So we feel that when you look at the different models that the state gives us for our alternative schools and our exceptional children's school, option B gives them the best option for um, the public view of like a school performance. They still get a school performance grade, but this goes along with it to show that they are making progress with these three um, percentages. So, do you have any questions? Okay, board, do you have any questions? Uh, Ms. Elliott? Mm -hmm. No, DPATS is an EC program primarily, right? And, it and it's an extremely different program, and so I can appreciate and understand this accountability program. Northview is different. It doesn't, does it have a big significant EC component or is it more just children with um, behavioral issues and other types of issues? Um, it can be both, but this is for alternative schools. So Northview falls under our alternative school model, model that the state allows the district to have. 
And so that's why they are able to fall under this option. Right. But the students who are at Northview thrive, many of them thrive in the unique programming that it offers, correct? And we do have students that we bring back that may have dropped out um, and have elected to come back. So anytime we enroll a student, they still count in our accountability model. Right. Um, so those would be our at-risk students. Um, the majority of the students there, yes, they do thrive. If Northview were assigned the grading as the other schools do, if they were, how would they fall? Um, probably an F. Okay. And so that's why the state gives us the, this option, so right. that, you know, they are they are an alternative school and they are looking at the behavior or the discipline issues. You know, when we long-term suspend a child, you know, they go and spend their time at Northview. And if it's during testing, they test there at Northview. Um, so, you know, Northview, you know, they can have students from all over the county. Um, when we enroll students from other states or districts that have been in an alternative school, then they go to Northview first for you know, an amount of time. Um, some of our group home children will go to Northview first before they go to a traditional school. So it just, they do have a wide variety of students there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Northview is a, is a way we keep children in school and uh, out of trouble. And uh, I think it's a very positive thing for those children. They can re-enter normal school after a period of time. And, uh, you know, if you keep children in school, you don't have to build bigger jails. And that's a proven fact. So are you recommending B? I recommend B. Okay. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve option B. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Any more discussion? Okay, Any more discussion? Dr. Knight, did you have a question? Comment? I do not. I'm sorry for the giggles. That's okay. Did you find your package? Yes, we found our payload. It went to 82,000 feet and landed in northeast Arkansas. Well, I, I, I'm going to let you, uh, you know, give a, 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 a something to the board about that. Maybe you'll show us what it, what it got. I can do that at next meeting if you wish. Okay. All right. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Pass it 7 0. Thank you very much. All right. Now, Ms. Parker. Good evening, Dr. James, Chairman Howell, um, members of the board. Tonight, we bring to you, Lauren Roberts, who's our lead media coordinator, and myself, we bring to you the process for selection of supplemental materials. Um, first of all, this is not a voting item. This is for information purposes. But over the last few months, we've been working to revise our process, um, applying it to the media centers and the classroom libraries, as we've modeled it after Mooresville's process, but we also wanted to align it to our district's instructional material process. One of the main differences to keep in mind on this one is it's for supplemental materials, which are not required for any student. These materials are available for optional selection by students. And I believe um, Ms. McCarrer had provided you with the link. So instead of reading through the whole thing, if you guys have any questions for us, we'll be glad to answer those or take a look at it. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Thank no you. questions. Anything else you want to say? No, but I have the next agenda. I was going to say, okay. I do want to just announce, though, that it is National School Library Month mm -hmm. for our media coordinators, and I do want to thank them for all of their hard work and their dedication that they bring. Um, and it was um, National School Library Day last week when they were off. So I just want to give them a shout out while I'm up here because they, they do. Thank you very much. Work and effort. There, yes, I agree. All right, Miss Parker, uh, these are first reading, correct? 
these are. So we're not going to vote on this. Uh, 5071, 7351, electronically stored information retention, policy 3225, 4312, and 7320, technology responsibility use, uh, policy 3220, uh, technology in the educational program, and policy 4310, integrity and civility. Yes, so policy 5071, 7351, the electronically stored information retention. Basically, the only revisions there are updates to the legal references to the new state records retention and disposition um, schedules, and a footnote was added there. Okay. Any questions about any of these? This is the first reading, so we will not vote. Ms. Parker, I have just one question. Um, on page four, it just discusses that it's okay for a student to share their student ID and password under certain situations. Are you still on this policy, or have you looked? Or which one are you looking at? I'm sorry, policy 3225. Okay, we haven't gotten to that one yet, but we can go through it now if you. If yeah, I'm sorry, I thought one. you were talking about them in, as a collective. Oh, no, there are several changes to that one. Right, right. And I was just wondering, you know, password integrity is a is an important thing. So what would be some situations where we would want children to share their student logins? Um, they are encouraged not to share them, especially with one another. Um, sometimes if we are trying to work on their computer, in lieu of us changing their password, we may ask them to share it with us if there's something we need to do on their computer, but in general, they don't share their passwords. That's part of the digital citizenship that we um, have students go through as well. Do you want me to go through the changes for that policy, the 32, 25, 43, 12, 73, 20, the technology responsible use policy? A absolutely. Okay. Um, this this policy has been updated extensively, basically to bring it in line with the current common technology related practices, except as otherwise indicated, all changes are recommended um, and should be considered in light of our own practices. So the first one, it eliminates the designation of the use of school technology resources as a privilege. Pre previously it stated it was a privilege, now it's pretty much required to do anything we do. Um, it's unavoidable not using technology throughout the school program, so that wording changed. It creates an exception in authorized situations for student personal use of school technology resources for amusement or entertainment. It adds requirements to follow terms and conditions of the use for software applications and subscription services. It, ex um, it accepts in limited circumstances and prohibits students from capturing or sharing audio, video, or photos of identifiable students or employees without their consent and the consent of the principal. It eliminates required requirements for users to scan downloaded files for viruses. It now prohibits users from disabling antivirus programs installed on school technology devices. It reminds users that it's their responsibility to back up important files. It broadens the responsibility to supervise student use of the internet to include all employees, not just teachers. It adds a requirement to adhere to rules issued by the superintendent or technology director for home use of school technology devices. It adds school managed cloud services to the storage locations that are not private. It prohibits the use of private Wi-Fi hotspots on campus to access the internet outside of the school system's wireless network. It deletes the old section D and instead addresses the information and relevant information from section A in a new section H, which changes the parental consent provision from consenting to the student's independent access to the internet to consenting to the student accessing the internet. Um, and it also updates the cross references and the footnotes. Any questions? Okay, thank you. This will sit for 30 days, okay. and then we'll ask you to vote. I have two more, too. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, policy 3220 is the technology and the educational program. It just updates the language throughout um, the policy to align with 
the 2022 North Carolina Digital Learning Plan and the current technology practices, and it updates the legal references as well. And the, the last policy I have is 4310, the integrity and civility. It specifies that copying the work produced by artificial intelligence is considered plagiarism, and it includes minor, um, a couple other little changes there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Steele. Now, these are, these, these are voting policies. We have talked about them. It's 8305, 8320-6402-6410-7650. Is there any specific questions any of the board members may have? Make a motion we accept these policies as written second. and as amended. I have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? If not, all those in favor? Signify by aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> so those pass. Thank you, sir. Miss Elliott. Okay, you have policies 2125, 40, 50, 40, 100, 40, 30, 40, 400, 40, 20, 3101. I forgot. What was the change on dual enrollment? I, that has lost, I have lost my mind. What was the change on that one? Uh, the 3101. Yeah, it just added under Section A, um, it referenced the College and Career Promise Agreement mm -hmm. um, and referenced the state board policy with that. And then it just updated some legal references and footnotes. Okay. All right, I'll entertain a motion. Question, question on attendance. I learned a lesson with my son. I brought him in and, uh, and went to the office and told him he was definitely on the farm, which used to be excused. Now it's no longer excused. Why is that? So we have a state accounting and attendance manual that's written by state, our legislators and state board, um, and they give us the allowable excused um, absences. So, you know, we have illness, we have medical, dental appointments, um, death in the family, illness, but working on the farm is no longer We used to have that when I was in school. And and it, if you'd have brought him in and said that he was sick, it would have been fine. I told him next time Dr. Sloan would have him a note. Yeah. Yeah, that used to be a big deal. Uh, students would come to school sick to so they would have that perfect attendance, but it uh, doesn't seem to be as important in our time today as it used to be. Time moves on. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to need a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve those policies. Any more discussion? Motions. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it passes 7 0. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Mazeo, you have. Policy 7130, 4023, 7233, 7340, 7430, 7503, 7520, 7540, 7550, 
7810, 7815, and 7810, or 7510, excuse me. Any questions about any of those? Comments. Dr. Mazzell, I have two questions. On 7130 licensure, the memo that was given to us says uh, adds a new subsection B.6. And the policy that we're looking at doesn't have a section 6 under paragraph B. So is your memo incorrect or, or something? There is an addition to. I do have a six. Hmm? Yes. So I'm just saying in the policy that we were provided, there is no paragraph six under B. I remember that discussion, and it was supposed to be corrected. Okay, so then perhaps maybe defer this one. Well, 7130 doesn't have subsection 6. So it sounds like we're not ready to vote on this one then? We could, we, you could, you, we could table that one and vote on it another time until all corrections are made. So then there's a similar problem with 7510. The memo states, uh, adds a new section D, and I don't see section D. Bring that back next month. We can table this one until I get you the right policy. Say that I didn't hear. I can. We can put this in the same category as licensure and bring it back next month. Okay. Well, well let's do that then. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kubinick. Any others? So then I think for, for voting purposes, for the policies brought forward to us by Dr. Mazzell, we would be voting for all with the exception of 7130 and 7510 is correct. Is that correct? Uh, I thought it was uh, 9810. The, the two policies I had a question on was 7130, licensure. The first one, item number 21. All right. And the last item, number 31, which was 7510. Okay. Eve. All right. So I think for the purpose of the motion, which I'm pleased to make, to approve policies um, listed under uh, number 22 to 30, uh, which would be the motion to approve. That's no problem. We'll leave out those two, and we can vote on the others, and then we'll bring that back when the corrections are all made. Is there any discussion now? Did, I, did you make the motion to approve? I did make the motion. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay, it passes 7-0. Thank you very much. So we'll bring those two back, 7130 and uh, 7510. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Jeff James is not here, so. Um, we still can present the policies, Chairman Howe. Okay. So we have 2120 Code of Ethics for board members. We have uh, 4150 school assignments and 4,700 student records. Any questions for Dr. James? These should reflect any comments the board members made in prior sessions to be included. <laughs> So, Mr. Chairman, I do have a, a question. All right. The uh, section in B.4, um, was, that, was that language, Dr. James, written um, by the engineer? 
that that was pushed back to the attorney dean and i had a conversation over at ashley and uh, my understanding is we felt like that should remain as is. <clears throat> okay, so basically what it's saying is do as I do as I do, not do as I say. It's not really subjugating the board to be an employee, but basically if you're going to set policies and procedures for employees, that board member should be expected to uh, adhere to those same policies and procedures. Okay. We did add section C because the board is a self-governing body. I don't believe that was in there to make sure that it was understood how you govern yourself. I concur with um, section C, the new section C, which is potential consequences, consequences for violations, which like you said, the board is self-governing and that uh, per Robert's rules, we would govern our board uh, in accordance with parliamentary procedure, which probably didn't need to be said, but I'm glad that you have it in here. But under um, B.4, where you say that the board members have to comply with all policies that set expectations for conduct, it doesn't say board members have to comply with policies that don't have to Um, comply with conduct. So, um, I would defer that to Ashley, but I'm reading it as you have to comply with all board policies and set expectations of conduct. So, whatever we would hold our leadership and teachers to, we would anticipate it uh, being applied to the board. To me, that's not clear. Therefore, I would like to make an amendment um, to say simply under paragraph B, board members have to comply with all Board of Education policies. So Ashley, can we add that and um, can we amend it and just uh, vote on it tonight and say as amended and we you get that added for us? Sure, so the, the language in B4 is from the School Board Association. Um, that was the language that they originally edited um, but we can, you know, if it's the board's pleasure, have that new language read and complying with all board policies, regardless of whether the policies expressly require compliance by board members, and just strike the phrase that set expectations for conduct. Yeah. I think another wording would be um, comply all applicable Board of Education policies. Sure. Okay, we can amend that as amended then, then that would take care of that policy. Are you saying it's amended now? Yes. Yeah, we can, uh, she can, you can vote on it now as can amended. Vote. Right. Yes, we don't have to table it. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to accept these. I'll make a motion to accept the policies as presented and as, as amended. Okay. A second. No second. If there's not a second, the motion will fail and we cannot approve these policies. I'll second. Okay. Dr. Knight has seconded uh, the motion. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh Opposed? No, I voted in. Voted for aye. Yes. So, we're voting. Just to be clear, we're voting with the amendment that says we have to comply with all board pol all applicable board policies. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And that's why I asked for a discussion on policy twenty six ten, which we're not complying with. Okay. And then no, you'll we'll, have it on the we'll agenda take care for next of that. month. We'll take care of that. I promise you. Okay then. I, I think it was unanimous. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um. All right, Dr. Knight, are you still with us? I am still here. All right, we have policy 7805, the superintendent's evaluation. And by the way, did y'all do those? <laughs> They're due at the end of the month. I okay. Believe. I was just questioning. Okay. 
Any questions for Dr. Knight about policy 7805? I'll entertain a motion to Mr. approve. Mr. Chairman, I'll make comments again since no one else wants to. Um, I would ask the board attorney to review what was submitted as it is not an exact replication of current policy. It's not a properly redlined policy. And secondly, if you vote yes for this policy, what you're basically saying is there's no date or timeline for this board to complete the evaluation of the superintendent. Um, Every teacher it? principal uh, requires a deadline for when their evaluation is due, and we need the discipline to force ourselves to complete his evaluation on time. Last month, it was suggested that we'd have some May and June milestones listed in this policy, and they're not there. Um, Chairman Howell, I would suggest we add either a May or a June policy, but I will say that that my evaluation is in state law. So but it does to to concur with with uh, Mr. Kubinick. Um, yes, other employees have a deadline, but there's reasons because of their evaluation being much different. But um, it doesn't May or June would be sufficient. Uh, I would say May. Uh, you definitely want to let a superintendent know before June if you're going to renew their contract or extend it. Well, by law, it has to be 30 days anyway, correct? Yes, yes. And, and, and I would say uh, state law says once a year. Yes. And, I mean, you want to put a month on it? Uh, I guess we could do that. But uh, uh, as long as we do it once a year, we're within the law. So, but if you'd like to put a date on it, and so if, if May is acceptable, we can add that to it, if it's okay. I'm okay with putting a date on it, but we need to make that a little soft, but we can put in there that we must comply with state law. Correct. And Mr. Chairman, I you can amend it, vote on as amended. I would concur with Mr. Kubinick in tabling this policy so that we can make sure it's a accurate red line of the current policy. 7805. Right. Okay. By the attorney's recommendation, to table this, unless there's a unless there's a, a, a person who doesn't like that, then let's table this and get it like everybody would can agree with it. Make a motion to postpone yes. policy 7805 until such time that a proper revision can be submitted. Okay, I have a motion. Do I need a second? Second. Okay, a motion is second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, with 7-0. So we have, we have tabled this one. Postponed it. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, I, I think we're okay there, but we can do, we can, as long as we uh, abide by state law, I think we're out of trouble. Okay, uh, policy 2010 was that paragraph I added. Uh, it has been corrected and uh, it has our head, our, our, our border on it. And is there any discussion about that? Uh, 2010? Yes, ma'am. Um, I would say uh, that I would agree that the superintendent needs to be notified. Not sure if the decision to accommodate the request um, needs to be in there. Basically, if he needed more time to fulfill the request, then he could respond with that. Um, but I just feel that if there was something that we really felt we needed to do our job effectively, then that should accom be accommodated. Well, to, to so answer. Chairman Howe. Sir. So um, I would say there's two thing two things here that come into play. If a re if a board member asks me to do something, I'm really not obligated to do it unless the board directs me to do so. That prevents any animosity between board members of taking more of our time or asking for things that are requiring employees to work. And since I'm your only employee, if the board asks me as a whole, like tonight, you told me to start posting 
the the documents for the upcoming meetings done deal the board directed me to do that so this policy is basically saying or trying to prevent i think is what your intent was mr howe of having one particular board member uh, ask for a lot of information that would require a lot of uh, extra work on employees um, correct we, uh, yes. in the general public if they do a FOIA request we actually are public information requests we call it that's what they're called for us if it's already public record, then we're not obligated to provide that for you. You're obligated to find it yourself. So I think that was the intent of the policy. And as the board as a whole, when y'all ask me to do something, I think you can say it gets done expeditiously. Well, correct. Uh, I put that paragraph in there um, to prevent a board member from requesting huge amounts of material from uh, one of our employees uh, that would take their time. And, you know, our employees, they're not going to say no to a board member. So if it goes through the superintendent, that board member certainly can get that information. But uh, what we'd like to do is like our employees to be able to do their job. And uh, maybe uh, you can get that information uh, a little easier. But that's why I put it in there. So. Um, so I have a question. So um, if somebody wanted to get get information and you copy the superintendent on what you needed, wouldn't that keep from that situation? Because it, now the superintendent knows. Yeah, but now it's written in board policy. Not exactly. Because... Because letting the superintendent know is one thing, but letting the superintendent come back and say, no, you can't have it is another. Okay, then you come before this, this board and say, I requested this from Dr. James, and he failed to give it to me. Then the board directs him to do it, and that's the way things are supposed to be done. One board member can't do it, but the board itself can do that. And that's, that's, there is a process. And you can get anything you want. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to keep anybody from getting any information that they think they need to do their job. But what I'm saying is I don't want to tie up our employees with requests from board members when maybe the superintendent could, a could answer your question, you know, right then. I don't have a problem with going through the superintendent at all. In fact, I think it that's good policy to go through the superintendent but i mean really this could be bypassed by just a FOIA request so why is it needed actually it couldn't because uh, the information well the way it was done is to keep a board member from uh requesting a lot of information from one of our employees and by by going through the superintendent he can you know maybe help that board member answer their questions and like you say if i don't get it then you know you can get it because if the board can go and then tell direct the superintendent to make sure you get that information so, it's, and it's Chairman really, Howe, yes, sir. I would say that a FOIA request has built in safeguards. If we load Jada up with 30 or 40 FOIA requests, then I'm going to come to the board and tell you that I need to hire additional help. So, um, it's not really getting around it. And I will tell you that most employees will, will call me anyway before they provide any documentation because, again, I'm your only employee. And they're going to contact me and say, what do I do with this? And I'm going to be involved in the process anyway, but it, it, but also it needs to be for the board's benefit, not one individual. So if some, if a board member asks something, there may be three other board members that want to know the same answer. So in that respect, you know, when you're in session, you direct me on what I need to, to look at, like you did tonight, then, you know, everybody's in agreement and everybody has their say so in the process. And nobody is uh, sequestering, you know, a lot of time from an individual employee or the superintendent. Okay. 
So does, does this policy apply to the board chair as well? Yes, sir. So, so when Mr. Bill asks for something, you don't really have to supply it to him unless the whole board wants it? No, that's, no, that you're, missing, you're misinterpreted. I, any board member right here can go ask the superintendent for something, and it, he can supply it right away. This is put in there from a board member going to an employee and saying to that person, I need this, this, and this, and taking that person's time. I understand, but I think Mr. James said that he's not required to give something to a board member unless the board approves, and that's just what I was asking about. It, hey. Most likely, he will not turn you down. I understand. If you go to him and ask him for information, he's going to give it to you. Nor, nor have I, but I, but I have, but I have told some board members that at, at this point, I feel like I am doing a lot of work for one board member instead of the whole board. So. Yes, and I understand when you get new board members on that my time is going to be shifted towards new board members getting them up to speed. And that always happens. Mr. Chairman, as a superintendent says, he is our one employee. Any communication that we would have to go through him it is not appropriate, in my opinion, for a board member to go directly to employees. And that shouldn't happen. But I don't think we need a policy that says you can't do that. I do think if a board member communicates with the superintendent and then he says, oh, go speak with so-and-so and get the information from them, that's great. And that's happened in the past. However, it is appropriate for the board member to copy the superintendent on all further communications, which is I think that's what we're doing. So this is a policy that's not needed. It's, it's a weaponization of material that a board member may want to know something, but again, he should go or she should always go through the superintendent. This policy is not needed and will only create angst when it doesn't, when it's not, doesn't exist. So hmm. I think we're creating an issue out of nothing here because to my knowledge, board members don't go directly to employees. They go to the superintendent first, and that's the way it should be. Yes, sir. I'm, I make a motion we amend to say that board members should notify the superintendent of any information um, and, and leave it at that. Uh, no, I, I wrote this policy, and it's going to either stand or, or, or fall. And, and I intended it to do that. And with all respect, we have had a board member that has gone to an employee and requested a tremendous amount of information and taken a lot of time from that employee from his job. Now, that did happen, and, and you know, you can deny it from now till the cows come home, but I know it happened. But then so, the employee um, clarified the situation. And, well, and then the person withdrew the request, not realizing no. how much work it was. No. And it happened one single time, and he actually redrew, withdrew the request. No, I don't know. Chairman Howell, um, I make a motion that we approve policy 2010 with the revisions. Thank you. I, I have, second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay, it passes 4-3, so that paragraph stays in. Now, any time you would like to come up with a board policy, uh, you know, I have told you that there is a process. Go through it, and it's fine, and it could be voted up or down. Chairman Howe, um, I don't know if, if the board member's microphone was on, but I could hear them curse after that vote, and I just don't think that that's appropriate, especially with this being live streamed and there potentially being children watching this. So I just wanted to Thank point you. that out. Okay. Um, we're at public comments. The Hardell States for Board of Education recognizes the voters have a right to speak to their elected leaders. We have set aside time for that. Each person who has signed up has three minutes to speak unless by board policy there is more than 10. 
At that time, the board will decide to allow three minutes or split the time down to accomplish a 30-minute time limit. Your remarks are not to be slanderous in nature or verbally abusive to one person or group. Please be aware the board members may be taking notes, so if they're not looking at you, do not confuse that member uh, as not caring to what you have to say. Generally speaking, the board does not respond to your comments. When you come up, please give your name and if you live in Iredale County. I think we got, is it Cheryl Fletcher? My name is Cheryl Fletcher, and yes, I do live in Iredell County, and I'm an interested uh, resident of the county. I have been a public health director and a director of nonprofit, and I am an interested citizen, and I often attend the county board meetings. And so my two points tonight, uh, one is about the transparency of the agenda. And uh, thank you, Mr. Howell, for making that decision. Um, because I did try to uh, come to this meeting and be thoroughly informed. And it's very difficult to be behind a person that's speaking and not to really have any idea about the policy. And so I did go to uh, Superintendent James and ask about that and uh, got asked if, there, if I had questions. Of course, I didn't because I couldn't see the policies. And the titles are really not that informative to what's in the policy. And uh, so Mr. James asked uh, if he could help me, what point. And uh, he said that many of the changes are state regulations. And so I'm thinking that makes it even more important for me to know what the state is having you do. And I think that's a, not just a, uh, my issue, but a bipartisan, just that people are able to find out what's happening and come to the meeting to be informed, because you can't walk in and be informed. And so, um, but just knowing that other counties, other school districts have those PDFs available that you can review. So I would come as a uh, informed citizen. So I thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Howell, for that decision. And uh, the same with the timing of the public comments. Um, if after all the decisions are made, then we have an opportunity to comment that's really uh, not timely for you all. So. Um, any opportunity to move that forward so that we could come and be informed citizens and give you any input that we might uh, feel like is urgent for you to know. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, can you read that name? Can't read your writing. Uh, number two. <laughs> uh, Lillian? Lillian? Is that, is it? I'm sorry, I can't read your writing, but welcome. You'll notice most of us wear glasses, so. <laughs> My name is Lillian Ubinas Petrillo. I live in Iredell County. I'm a member of the um, Ethical Education Alliance. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the rubric that I don't know if it was voted on or passed, but um, I, of course, have issues with a lot of it because it affects our children. And it's very important that we maintain the purity of our children. I appreciated that comment about the cursing of the phone, but uh, over the live stream or whatever that connection is. But when children are allowed to read curses in the books at school, that's a bigger problem. It's in front of them. When they're able to view images that they cannot get out of their mind, that's a bigger problem. You can't erase that. That's, that's embedded in their mind. But I'm here to talk specifically on the profanity, the language. 
And I appreciate also, I would agree, um, if we can move the public com comments earlier. I bring my daughter with me. She's exhausted for school the next day. And, and we are concerned citizens. We know you're trying to do the best thing. But to do the best thing, you need to be advised. You need to hear from your constituencies. So I request that our public comments will be moved up as well. All right, in regard to the rubric, putting a number five to 10 or 10 to 20 on the number of instances vulgar words or material can be used seems to imply that it's okay as long it stay, as the material stays below certain thresholds. Does that really make sense? If a high school book has the F word 10 times and the N word 10 times, is that okay? I'm Spanish, I wouldn't like the S word. I would be offended by that. Having instructional materials with these types of words in them normalizes the behavior. Saying kids already speak like this is untrue, and it's simply a cop-out. Are we okay when books has the N-word in less than 20 times, but then we're aboard when high school students dress up in KKK costumes and have their pictures taken and prol proliferated throughout social media? We should set st higher standards across the board. We should really rear these children up to be good citizens based on the value that our founders uh, developed, our Constitution, Judeo-Christian values. Can we find more useful, worthwhile instructional materials that don't have the vulgar and profanity in it? There's a lot of good material out there. There's no need to have ugly words uh, to be given to our children. That's true for a lot of the stuff that they're allowed to see. I, I wasn't here for the meeting, but they talked about a system that um, kind of filters out bad books in, in the schools, and I think that's great. The problem is the website has a link to the library systems, which has access to all that material. I opened up a book, and I was shocked. You really need to look at what you're approving. I just want to see if I have time to read this. Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If anyone Thank you very much. Your time is gone. Okay. I appreciate that. But God, you have to Thank you very much. Lord. Shirley Clendenin. Is it Clendenin? Good evening. My name is Shirley Clendenin, born in Ireland County mother of six and grandmother of 10, I read the proposed rubric for our schools. I was concerned that uh, the copies of this rubric did not get to the parents in the county, public school students, parents. Uh, does this rubric, you think, support or violate the North Carolina Parents' Bill of Rights? In my assessment, it violates the bill and has no regard for the parents' opinion. Why do you say you are a board of transparency and integrity and have no regard for parents' opinions? I see that you use the ALA as an approved reading list. Did you know the president of the ALA is an avowed lesbian Marxist who along with her partners say she is on a crusade to stock libraries with porn. To refer to the ALA for book reviews indirectly violates North Carolina general statutes. The ALA president says she found a magical book at age 14 that convinced her to be a lesbian. Since then, she uses her powerful profession to destroy the hearts and minds of millions of our students by sending LGBT material all over America. Thankfully, Missouri and Montana have cut ties with the ALA and eight more states are considering cutting off funding to this organization. My questions after reading the rubric why would the ISS want to use books and instructional material that refer to and possibly promote consensual sex acts? High school students are not mature enough to be making consensual decisions on whether to be having sex. Would you agree? Do we want our students age 14 
to 17 making these decisions? Should we be using materials that even imply they are empowered to make these decisions? My answer is no. So it is unclear why the rubric seems to imply consensual sex in limited detail or implied is okay. But on the other hand, I would like to thank you for hiring some great teachers in the ISS. I knew two of the ISS teachers personally and want to thank you for hiring very exceptional teachers in Iredell County whose cho choices for teaching materials would align with the North Carolina Parents Bill. Thank you very much. Your time has expired. <laughs> Joe Crendana. Pass. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Abullis, is that right? I'm Lisa Bullis, and I'm looking Sorry. Are we good? Okay. Good evening, Chairman Howell, board members, and Superintendent James. Free speech must not be hindered. The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. President John F. Kennedy said, the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. He also said children are the world's most valuable resource and the best hope for the future. President John F. Kennedy also said, a revolution is coming a revolution which will be peaceful if we are wise enough, compassionate if we care enough, successful if we are fortunate enough, but a revolution which is coming whether we will it or not. We can affect its character. We cannot alter its inevitability. President Ronald Reagan said, ours was the first revolution in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of government with three little words, we the people. We the people tell government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are the driver. The government is the car. And we decide where it should go and by what route and how fast. Almost all the world's constitutions are documents in which governments tell the people what their privileges are. Our constitution is a document in which we the people tell the government what it is allowed to do. From God's holy word, Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Paula Memnon. Haven't heard from you in a month or so. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? My name is Paula Memna. I live in Iredell County. Um, I am part of the Ethical Education Alliance, not Moms for Liberty. Uh, we seek to promote wholesome materials for children in public schools. Jesus is our sword and shield. When our country was first beginning, the first schools used Bibles as the main or only source of reading material. Schools were developed to promote morality and to love and serve God. How can you have liberty without morality? How can you have morality without the study of God's word? I have examined the ISS proposed, it was appropriateness definitions that I was thinking was the rubric, but actually that's what we were looking at. And there are five topics that are explored with uh, respect to grade levels. And the topics are sexual content, violence, crude or vulgar language, profanity or offensive language, and drugs and violence. This is for levels K through high school. We're concerned that the public does not know what is contained in this appropriateness definitions and, of course, the rubric also. And that's why we're talking about it today. How is it appropriate to teach children about violence at school? 
At grades six through eight, violence is acted out or described, but it is near, neither extreme nor persistent. Why, it is necessary, or why is it necessary for children ages 11 to 13 to study violence in depth? Violence or description of violent acts occur for grade levels 9 through 12. At the supplemental level, intense violent acts or disturbing imagery occur. Gun violence or other weapons are present. At the media center level, frequent graphic descriptions of violent acts, disturbing imagery, and torture occur with little or no historic context. How is this appropriate for children ages 14 to 18 to study? Review sites for novels are listed in the review process. Why are the American Library Association and the North, Car North Carolina School Library Media Association listed as reference sources? If you search the titles that were removed from ISS using the above sites, they publish innocuous looking reviews, have articles that promote the author, and show certain books as award winning. These reviews do not indicate the true nature and content of these books. The chair of the American Library Association, as was mentioned, is an avowed lesbian Marxist who wants to sexualize and indoctrinate American children. This is a conservative county. How is this appropriate for ISS students? We hope that parents will communicate with all board members, including those who consistently vote against righteousness, and let them know what you think about this um, appropriateness for, for uh, materials. And. Um, I have a scripture here. Uh, see that you do not despise these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. That's Matthew 18.10. Destiny Follett is online for 98 out of 100 counties. This should be reinstated for Iverdale ASAP. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was asked, uh, you were not here, but we, would we... Uh, open the session at four o'clock today. We heard a presentation from a lawyer, and there is a, a lawsuit, a national lawsuit, uh, uh, suing these uh, companies like Google and uh, that have, you know, platforms for 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 people and how addictive they are uh, on our children. Well, uh, this board voted to join that lawsuit. It was no cost to the taxpayers. So we are a part of that now. And uh, if you would like to, to hear it, uh, it, is, it, is, it was streamed. So you'll be able to get it on uh, our website or YouTube. You'll be able to get it on that and, and, and hear the presentation of the attorney. And uh, as I said, uh, these, th these platforms that a lot of our students use uh, are created to be addictive, uh, not, uh, not anything different than uh, nicotine is or certain drugs. So uh, this board did vote to, uh, to join that lawsuit, and I thought you'd like to know. Um, April 9th, uh, Dr. James, did you have anything tonight? Yeah, Chairman Howe, first and foremost, apologize. I am under the weather and didn't want to get other employees sick. Uh, but wow, the accolades that our students took tonight were amazing. Uh, if you get a chance to go to the, the uh, math expo and some of the other events, as I, I try to get to all of them, I can. It is absolutely amazing what our kids can do. And to have 19 students to get selected to the governor's school is unheard of across the state. So I want to commend our teachers, our leadership across our schools, and the community for supporting uh, the top performing school system in its county. And I would uh, <clears throat> like to remind everyone that uh, our economic growth in our county that we're seeing is exploding, and I think the board understands that very much. We couldn't do that, um, ladies and gentlemen, without a great education system between us and Morrisville so Graded School. We're right at 90% of the school systems that are in Iredell County, so we supply a great part of the blue-collar workforce and, of course, white-collar. But um, I did send the board a note from Doosan. Uh, I had the opportunity to be at the career fair several about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and I believe some of the board members had an opportunity to go. We had over 70-some employers there, and um, 
one of the executives from Doosan uh, made a special uh, trip out in the hallway to talk to me about our girls robotic team at South Iro High School and the letter they had drafted looking for support. That same group has been on uh, Spectrum News for about a 10 minute segment about a week and a half ago, um, talking about what they have accomplished. So we could not do this without a great group of people. And I wanna commend the employees uh, and that's where the rubber meets the road. And I do know that Esther's is running out as the board's aware of, and we're trying to make decisions to make sure that uh, we do not impact classrooms. So we're out uh, recruiting wherever we can and the culture of our school system uh, and the successes we're seeing definitely attract high quality candidates that want to become part of a successful team. So we want to thank our uh, great staff and again, apologize for not being there in purpose uh, in, in a person, but um, did get to see these individuals when I awarded them at uh, <clears throat> the event. So, uh, and I did sign uh, two or 300 certificates and I'd be happy to sign 10,000. Our kids are, are just doing astronomical in each and every category across our district. So I commend the staff and the community for their support. And I would say that uh, as I've told the various groups that have approached us about materials, just continue to let us know of anything that, that you uh, see or a kid is, has access to that you feel is inappropriate. And we definitely uh, will continue to review that material uh, and to make sure that uh, our community values are represented as, as well as possible in our school system. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, May 6th is going to be Committee of the Whole here and May 13th will be the Board of Education meeting. And I will tell you that uh, we're having to build a bunch of schools because there's a lot of people coming to this county. And I, one of the reasons they're coming to this county is because we have excellent schools. No, we're not perfect, but we do the best we can with what we have. I might also remind you that we're, our county is, I believe, in the top 10 for collections of revenue. But yet we're three from the bottom and per pupil spending. Harnett County, I think, spends more than we do, and that's a poor county. Vance County spends more than we do, and that's an extremely poor county. And I want you to know that we're pound for pound, dollar for dollar, our children are getting the good stuff, the good stuff. Thank you for your comments tonight. I need a motion to adjourn, please. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. I have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>